and then this is um, uh, 1643 in this um, in this conference that they had. That's where it kind of blew out a little bit, but there are a few years there. Um, and I didn't know that we were going by this a little bit. Well, we were probably Luther. He wasn't. Um, and, uh, so Luther wasn't this on the scene day one, this big hammer nailing the, you know, and starting a revolution. He really was kind of a reformer. Wanted to be a reformer from the end. That was kind of his thing. Um, well, John Tyler, he wrote this, and with the brain press and stuff, it started kind of circulating around. But he himself was having some problems, you know. He, he was, in fact, he was like a pastor, uh, he was very strong Protestant, right? He was, he was in the movement, but um, he was actually the pastor of the church in Geneva. And him and this other guy that he's kind of partnered with, um, they basically told the congregation there on the Sunday, it's like, look, you're not Protestant enough. And so we're not going to offer communion to any of y'all. And he was out of town, basically. Um, they had a lot of trouble. All of these writings are kind of circulating around. And so then he ends up coming back and becomes the John Calvin that we know, you know, one the, the leader of the Reformation movement. Uh, so this kind of where you call house. Um, Calvinism is this reformed. This reformed theology, which we'll define a little bit in a minute. Um, but the Presbyterian Church itself, America, kind of developed later. Um, but if there is a church, if there is a denomination that is Calvinism, like Lutheranism came from Luther, if there was a church or if there was a denomination that we would call Calvinism, um, it's the Presbyterian Church. Are there any others that are That's it. Okay. And this is the, this is I'm I'm really I found a picture that I'm gonna show you in a minute that kind of helps me a little bit, but I was really trying to wrap my mind around several things. Um, in that there's these different denominations, right? Well, there's there's Catholicism, and we kind of understand the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism, right? Um, Orthodox is almost parallel with with Catholicism. Um, but then there's these different movements, right? So you can have a Reformed Baptist church, a right? Calvinist Baptist church. Uh, at the same time, there's other labels that are thrown around out there that we can look at. So a couple of them, but you probably heard of fundamentalists, right? And you probably heard of, and you've heard me say evangelicals before. Um, so there's these. They're not denominations, but they're ideas, they're movements, and they can go across denomination. Um, so when we talk about denomination, it's, it's kind of that core set of beliefs that we kind of unify around. Um, but then even within that, there's these different movements. That makes sense. So it's, it, I'm Really, I have to get the word pictures in my mind on things a lot of times. So I'm still trying to figure out how I can like visualize that and see it. Um, but we can go through it all. You know, we can talk about it at the end. And um, so the Presbyterians, I mean, that's just the number uh, that uh, they don't have a part on the on the um, space. It, it's not a small church, but there's only a couple in the United States. Um, and we're trying to kind of stick through a lot of this because um, their one of their doctrine is it's still core Protestant doctrine. It just got these little side books that are different. Right? And so um, scriptures and you know inspired and valuable. I mean, absolutely stole up principles of the following so, um, is a witness about parallel lives. Um, so they have a little bit different, really similar to the time. So they you know may not hold as high people scripture even, uh, but they basically follow the standard Protestant doctrine of God and Trinity, the group of Trinity. Um, Jesus all of this basic um, Protestant ideas about Jesus. Um, salvation. You know, we're saying about Christ alone, a lot of Jesus does to get Christ and to faith alone, in Christ and God. I mean, that works for so far. 
and then good works are these as a result of the truth today. So it's so important at this level we're constantly paid, right? Um, so after death, we're okay with this too. So the loser go to Christ, they try to turn by the ways, uh, so they would go to hell. Um, this is kind of uh, so what they believe is part of the church itself. Um, represented by the way, you know, it's the goal chosen. So the people who have been represented in the biblical church, both churches, um, Christ wants to head the church, and in their system, congregations should be elders to govern them, the religious should be elders, or presbytery, meaning the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God things we actually do for presbytery also. Um, if we're going to ordain a pastor, we call together a presbytery, which is basically kind of like a council of elders, and usually it's other pastors. And they literally lock each other to come over day here. But um, this is how, you know, I've seen it in other Baptist churches where the presbytery the, um, will have two parts. One is they'll um, interview, I started to interrogate, but they don't care. It's an interview, right? They interview the candidate and then it's going to be a private meeting. And then they have a public uh, question and answer also. Just to verify that if you're going to make you, um, you know, make sure that you, you know, your beliefs are solid. And so, um, so this idea is not foreign to us either. Um, uh, although this is kind of how they run, uh, at, you know, at a higher church level. Um, sacraments, sacraments of non-sacred salvation, time, they say that Jesus' body and blood are spiritually present to believers in the Lord's Supper. Again, you know, we say it's symbolic, uh, but that's not too far off from us, especially when you compare it to. Lutherans or uh, Catholics. Yeah. Um, this part, so we're going to get into this more, but I didn't want to start over because they do have very strong beliefs on these five points of Calvinism. Okay. Um, so we're so simple, we cannot initiate for God, God chooses to say, uh, Christ that simply is they who God chose, God and God will be Christ. Those who each and they will never fall back. Um, we'll get into those a little bit more. So they believe one saved all the same. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Absolutely, because you're not saved unless you're chosen. So, yeah. Did, was this, did they get this because this was a belief of John Calvin? The <laughs> same way? I mean, so, my question, my question is I'm, I'll be interested. So one of the details. This is the verses, and this is our interpretation of the verses. Yes, uh, yeah. It, 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 in a minute, um, I don't, I don't have anything that we like break it down verse by verse because I mean, we really didn't have time, you know, for that. But I can answer that when we okay. get to the end of this, um, and that's a very, very. Uh, I mean, that's a poor, poor example, but that's a that's something that I absolutely wanted to bring out about uh, about Calvin himself. We could say by today's definitions, Calvin wasn't a Calvinist. Uh, but yeah, but these five points don't actually come from Calvin, they come from someone else, which I'll show you. Okay. Um, so anyway, this is kind of where they're at as far as and these five are what we were doing. So um, so they may have actually changed a little bit. They do have um Presbyterian churches are pretty liberal compared to us um in, in a couple of ways. Um, I think that they um, in general, take like a little bit less fundamental way of looking at the Bible. Um, and like women preachers, um, I think they may have been banking, um, Galen and leaders also. I've got a friend at a Presbyterian church and they left it because they were allowing that. Yeah. And they want to stay Presbyterian, but they're trying to find a church that says true to. <laughs> Fundamental of yeah. Uh, okay, so then, um, so this is actually uh, the church price. And this one, I'm just gonna kind of just do this. I was gonna put it in here because I wanted to show how you know this Baptist line came out. And uh, you remember the Baptists actually came out of the Puritans in England, which was almost like a reformation to the reformation of King Henry VIII when he broke away from Catholicism. But we'll see in a second, um, Anglicanism is basically Catholicism. They just kind of kicked out the code, you know. 
Um, so, but anyway, but this is uh, this was you know um, the 1800s, um, and the Anabaptists. We kind of talked about that a little bit also. Um, actually, I think we talked about that last week. So I'm just gonna kind of jump through these. Um, oh, I love this in here because these are Baptists. This is actually exactly what we believe. And if you really look at the Anabaptist group, what they believe, what they say they believe, we're pretty close to what they believe. Um, they believe in believer's baptism, uh, so they don't have uh, infants. Um, so they have a lot of a lot of same beliefs. The real difference in them is that if it were to come down to doctrine or lifestyle, you know, they're going to choose lifestyle. Right? So they're not going to be too worried. If you're one of them, they're not going to be too worried. You, if, as long as you don't like cause waves in this community. You have a slightly different belief, they're not going to like worry about it too much as long as you're one of them, you know. And so they're they're less fundamental. Let me definitely that. I mean, fundamentals really was kind of a movement in the late 1800s, um, and it was really a kind of counter movement to the industrial revolution and the scientific revolution and all that, especially with Darwin and all of this, right? It was a movement that said we're going to hold on to our beliefs. Our traditional Christian beliefs. Right? Um, so we're going to hold on to the idea that God created heaven and the earth. We're not going to accept this new thing that the science that the science is saying. You know, and so that's kind of what fundamentalists are. Um, but fundamentalists through the years also have gotten kind of a reputation to be a little bit more militant and violent. Um, that's why I'm like, I don't like to pull a lot of the labels. Like I don't want to be called a fundamentalist, even though I have very fundamentalist beliefs. Um, that's why I kind of like the, the if I'm going to be labeled as something like that, I'd rather be labeled as evangelical because that then encompasses more the idea of holding on to these to this gospel message. The evangelical comes from the same Greek word as gospel, right? And so I had this thing, uh, these same ideas that Christians have always carried. I'm not going to compromise my beliefs because someone else out there says it. Right? So, so it is fundamentalist, but I also don't want to be labeled as. Don't want to be, oh, no, John, you seem pretty violent. <laughs> um, okay, so well, here's the Anglican Church. I'll kind of say this one too. So, um, you all know this story probably. He wanted a divorce, and so Pope wouldn't grant it. He said, we were out, you know. Um, I mean, there, there's things more subtly been there, I'm sure, but essentially, kind of at a high level, that's what it is. Um, and so, this was. A little bit after the Reformation started, but not a long time after. Right? I mean, we're talking still a few years, right? So I don't know if anybody heard about what was happening with Luther and Calvin and stuff and said, hey, Catholic Church is not that big, big bully it used to be, so we'll just kick them out. And actually, I don't think he even like really kicked them out. He basically just said, the Pope's not in charge anymore. We're just going to keep all of our bishops and priests because they're still English. So now they report to me instead of the Pope. Um, the Queen, a well, lot she passed away. So the Queen, the Queen was the head of the church, the Anglican Church, the King Charles, right? So King Charles is now the head of the Anglican Church. Um, so you know they have they have 80 million worldwide or so. Um, their scripture contained truth, central salvation, primary norm of faith, but Sharpened in a lot of tradition and reason. So, again, it's that same type of idea that, uh, that the Catholics have that, oh, here's this church tradition. And so, we're going to have a kind of a lower view of the Bible and a higher view of tradition kind of sets them uh, a little bit more on the same level. Um, they might put the perspective, they don't believe in scriptures, so they're, they back off that a little bit. The Catholics believe. Um, they do believe that you know that the church is still this Catholic idea and this apostolic idea, and so they're they basically are just taking those same ideas that Catholics have and they're just saying this is us, right? Um, and uh, they have this line, and they're also this kind of holds like this lower and power and these two different things, like if you're reading it or whatever. That's why they have over here they have it. That's why the Anglican Church believes that the church is one holy Catholic and apostolic, right? They don't believe they're Catholic, as in the Catholic Church, but they believe that they're Catholic, as in one church. 
church. Right. I read it this way, John. I pronounce it. Uh, uh, no, it's me and my brain just so great to Oh, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, that's kind of, yeah, that kind of makes it, that kind of changes the um, conjugation. Uh, okay, so then Methodists, uh, they were founded by John Wesley, um, which, you know, that my middle name is Wesley, and I'm not named after this John Wesley, I'm named after the other John Wesley. Apparently, that's what my boss said, uh, the outlaw. Uh, but, um, so this is kind of what they call that. So they, they came out of the Anglican church, um, and then here's some other groups. I don't know if you or not, the Salvation Army is actually a church. Um, and they have they have quite a few members. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip into this a little bit because um, they're pretty close to what we believe. I mean, you would seem weird coming out of the Anglican Church, but they 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 kind of dipped out of the Anglican Church a lot closer toward Protestantism um, and what we believe. So the Trinity, Jesus, this is all this is all repeated. Um, salvation by grace alone, we are not be generous and give us the faith in Christ and opportunity by the works. Uh, good works are necessary, necessary result of true faith, but not in salvation. Uh, after death. Um, same thing that we believe. Uh, church, basically, they, 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 no, they do have bishops go into regions. Um, uh, and they, they, we, their pastors are a little bit different uh, than the way that we, we do it. So we can call you know, our own pastor, whereas they have a little bit bigger organization. Um, and they have clarity and laity also, which we have. We have the same thing. Really, all that means is you know, our, the clergy is like Patrick Walk and John, and, you know, and we're the late people. So, John, was it more like a full on Baptist type, and then it ch changed after he stepped away because he was pretty solid? Who's that? John Wesley, right? Oh, John Wesley. Yeah, I mean, every all that this church would say was exactly what John Wesley was doing. They, <laughs> Probably so. And, and, and even today, a lot of the, um, do you remember how we were saying like there's the mainline denomination, right? And that's kind of defined as when you're established before 1900. Right. And groups that break away are usually conservative groups because the mainline, uh, basically all the mainline denominations are sliding more toward liberal theologies. So you have these groups that are breaking off. And literally, right now, today, in the Methodist Church, they're, if they haven't split yet, I haven't seen the latest, but if they haven't split off yet, then the conservative churches are about to you know, split they, off. They, they have the same they, problem with Presbyterian. <laughs> I think. Oh, and Presbyterian think, too? Could be. I think it's both with women and the pulpit and the sexuality. Yeah, that's, that's, that, I think that's kind of one of the, one of the biggest issues. Um, but daily Jesus is really present, uh, and his body and blood are spiritually present to believers in the Lord's Supper. Still not right to the point where we are, but still a long ways from transubstantiation. Constantly. I can't say it. Okay, so uh, this part is uh, talking about how the entire manifestation for spirits, that's going to be integration. About all sins and service, they can be Methodists, this is the part that I want to get to right here. Methodists are um, very much Armenian, right? And so when we talk about this kind of this push and pull between um, Calvinists and Armenian, Methodists are the ones that are really, like, really there. Um, we're close, but we're not. You know, we're in the out in the middle of the middle. We'll see that in a minute. But um, so this is what this is what Armenian is really. Jacob Armenian. Um, he came actually after Calvin. Um, I think even after after Calvin. I think Calvin had already died um, when Armenius was um, like active. And basically, this had to do also with the um, with the Dutch Revolution. And why today we have the Netherlands and Belgium, because in that whole region, Protestantism and Catholicism, I 
mean, that was the age of religious wars, right? There was all these, you know, so this whole city would become Protestant, but then there could be a Catholic army that comes in and it just like tries to convert them back. Uh, or they're Protestant and they're trying to convert their neighbors. I mean, it was kind of crazy the way it was kind of laid out. But in, in the Netherlands, there was actually a revolution. And so the Netherlands themselves were Protestant and then Belgium was Catholic. And so they literally solidified into two different nations, right? Um, and so he was in Belgium during this time. And this kind of gets to your point, we'll see it in a little bit more in a minute, but um, the five points of Calvinism were not actually from Calvin. Calvin just had these ideas, really, I think, represented like three of them mainly. Um, but Calvin's ideas were developing. And then even after he died, there were several leaders later that kind of continued that development. And his ideas actually go all the way back to. Um, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, what's his name? I guess, you know. Yeah, in like the 300s, right? And so, Scotland wasn't the first Calvinist in that regard. Um, and so, uh, so we get all the way to this one. So, what happens is here's this reformed idea, and David was actually Calvinist. And then he started like questioning these things. And so, he came up with these points against what, and he came up with these five points against what Calvin was saying. And then later on, the Calvinists came back, or the reformed guys came back, and they they, they did a point-to-point -point counter to his. That's where we get the two main thing, right? And so that was never really a thing of Calvin. It was more a thing of uh, a reaction to this guy. Um, and so, um, and so I like that they put this definition here right here also because we even today have this like like sort of like this idea of Calvinist versus Arminian, right? Um, that's kind of what you hear as a debate, but it's really uh, it, it's not a simple. Uh, okay, so so in this day we have this man in this right here. That's the one that is. You said I already broke up. They've been, they've seen that on. Like they've already yeah. split or getting ready. Yeah, at church we meet at for our principal for a lot. They've already split. Okay. Um, I was talking to somebody um, uh, like back in November, and she was like really, I mean, she's like Methodist, Methodist, and, and she's definitely in Methodist ready to leave. <laughs> and she's not afraid to tell you exactly what she's talking about. Um, it's my new son in law's grandmother. But uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on Pentecostal churches, only to say that uh, you know, the, the turn of the century there, um, especially with the street outpouring in Los Angeles. Um, but from this, um, Assemblies of Gods came, and then um, also um, charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches, of God. Um, I am going to kind of flip through there. Uh, well, there's, there's a few million of them, um, but their beliefs. Are, are really close to ours. The biggest difference with them is going to be uh, speaking in tongues uh, and, and spiritual gifts. Now. Um, visions and trends. I mean, this has been a couple of churches over the world. It is definitely a lot collection. Um, and so they, they do have a couple of different main bodies. And there are other churches. Uh, I know I literally didn't put any of them in there, but. Uh, there's Adventist churches, church pride, you know, but this just kind of gives you an idea of how how these reformers and even the Baptists, because the Baptists were Puritans and the Puritans were absolutely reformed, right? Um, and the Methodist and also, of course, it breaks out uh, before after that. Um, okay, so, um, this is the God. <laughs> uh, so, okay, cool, we have this up. Okay, cool. Um, so, so this is John Calvin. I've already kind of said about like, like a little bit of history that I wanted to say. I don't think I was going to say anything else about that. Um, so, let me say this right here first, though. Oh. Where did John Calvin live? Where did he live? Okay, I don't know why that's not one up there. But um, this, this, this part right here just kind of goes back to there's another site of that. I don't know why. 
The other side is the Augustinian kind of view. Uh, but kind of in this debate, uh, a lot of times um, they were accusing each other of being Pelagian, which um, they denied. Oh, I need to slide. Uh, Am I prop with each of them? I guess I did. Um, but that's great. Okay. That's not really important. I just wanted to kind of throw that up there because in one of these other slides, kind of slide kind of puts it at the top. But um, so basically, when, when we're talking about um, Calvinism, we're looking at like two main two main ideas, and, and one main idea you may have never heard about, but the kind of the biggest one that we normally think of is predestination. Um, and so that idea. <laughs> Uh, in in Pal well, let me pull up the um, uh, this right here. So this this is what's come down to the five points of Calvin. So let's work through this and then through this so you can kind of see what each one of these. Is. So this is that two <laughs> Um So total title. Now this one we're going to tend to agree with this, right? We we believe that we're we are sinners and we're totally deprived, and so. Uh, they say, oh, this is scripture. Oh, and this is actually a, a reformed uh, source. So, because I didn't want to, at one time in, in college, I got in trouble. I wrote a paper on uh, baptism, and I took, I, I wanted to have two different kind of extremes. And so I used Catholicism and Baptist, baptism. And I mean, I literally went all the way back to the Jewish rituals, Hindu uh, rituals. Carried it all the way through in the most um, uh, un unbiased way that I could, right? I was just stating the facts and went through. And so my teacher, who he happened to be uh, just failing also, but um, he didn't have any problem at all with anything that I said. But I made a B on the paper because all of my sources were Baptist sources. Including the Catholic ones? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't use a primary Catholic resource, he was like, "No, nope, I think I'm just straight up a letter grade, just right off the top." Wow. So I was like, "Yeah, okay." So this is a Calvinist perspective. So when you read this, and it says things like um, somewhere in oh, his quote derived from scripture, right? So these are the scriptures that they're using to support each one of these things. Uh, and a lot of this we're going to believe, and I'm trying, I was trying really hard to figure out a way to my mind around, uh, around some of this, but um, so the public credit, uh, I've been in the same sin, he's not being provoked, he's not understand the things he did, 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 so uh, this is kind of how I figured out how to do this. So we got D U what L I T, right? Okay, so I was like, how how can I make this make sense to you? Because this right here, um, I'm not exactly on board with this. You know, probably, probably I won't understand how to get that, but we, we can't understand spiritual things when we're lost. Like, I mean, I, I would need them like to explain a little bit more about that, but knowing what I know about their belief, with like limited atonement and stuff like that, that's a very strong statement for us to handle, right? Um, because he's saying that we can't initiate it, right? It's got to be God that moves first. And so we can kind of believe also, but you. Well, something yeah. should begin with the Holy Spirit speaking to you in a way that you can clearly understand that you need Christ the Savior. So, and you yes. have to begin to it. So, I can agree with that. If their intent was you can't understand scriptural things, if their intent is to say because they're spiritual, you can't understand it until you're spiritually born. Yes. So, if that's their point, then I can. I don't agree with necessarily how they say it, but. Exactly. So, so when, I, when I'm kind of trying to really piece this together, what I'm coming to the conclusion of is that each one of these is actually more like a spectrum. Yes. And so,
so these people, you know, they may be um, over here, whereas I might be over here on this, one, right? Um, and the same thing is going to happen in a minute. You can look at, you know, because Lutheran, well, he believed in predestination also, but not in the same way as Calvin did, right? And certainly not to the same extreme. And so on each of these, I've decided this is how I can understand this a little bit, you know, that depending on which side of the line you're on, uh, you might be labeled a Calvinist, right? Because if you're on the left hand side of the line, even if we're kind of over here like this, right? So this guy may call this guy a Calvinist only because he's on that side of the spectrum of these things, right? Uh, so then, uh, the other one, unconditional election, God does not base his election on anything. He sees an individual. He chooses the elect according to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the kind of uh, intention of his will without any consideration of merit within the individual. Uh, so uh, this, this doctrine right here is closer to, um, you know, like hyper Calvinism more, you know, uh, it is further on the further on the um, because um, we can go along with this concept a little bit, right? Unconditional, uh, unconditional election. Um, but then, in, in certainly a more extreme viewpoint, um, they're going to say that God literally, before the foundation of the earth, said, I am going to make my own decision and I'm going to choose. Even though I'm going to know what people are going to do, but I'm going to choose, right? And we'll see in the second part that choice kind of comes out. But um, and in limited atonement, this is the one that we we really have a problem with. Um, I heard somebody say one time, but well, he was struggling. You know, he was like, "Depends on kind of where you're at." He's like, "We're really kind of four point five powers instead of five point powers, you know, because our our kind of where where you're at." This is the big one. So um, they say that Jesus died only for the elect. Who did Jesus sacrifice? Um, it, although Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient for everyone, so his sacrifice could cover everyone, but in reality, it only applies to the elect from you know from the from the blah, 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 right? It only applies to the elect. Um, so Jesus, yes, Jesus only bore the sins of the elect, where Jesus died for many, uh, which they had to decide for the chief, um, but in these are different verses, but I don't know what he's and where Jesus prayed for the ones given to them. Right? So they're using these verses to, to build this case of uh, limited atonement. Um, so irresistible grace, this one is also kind of on the spectrum a little bit, um, because um, when God calls us away in salvation, they cannot resist God offers to all people the document, which I don't really understand this clearly from them, because if God offers his gospel message to everyone, but that their idea is that those that God has chosen, they won't have a choice. Right? God's chosen you, he is going to apply this irresistible grace and you will be saved. You will accept him because that's what he said. Um, and then Christians of the saints flowing from that exact thing because God has chosen you and you are one of the chosen and you can't be, you can't be lost. Which we believe in preservation of the saints also for the same reason, except not for the limited atonement part of it, right? We think that once you're saved, then you're truly saved and always saved, uh, and nothing can take you from the hand of God. Um, but we believe it for slightly different reasons. Right? This is so almost minutia that, but my question is this. Do Calvinists say God works like this? Okay, and I'm not. I'm God. I tell my son Jesus before time even begins. I create the universe. If you die 
for every single person ever born, and they've got an opportunity to accept you as your savior, I for know who's going to accept you as savior and who isn't, even if you die for everybody. So since I already know, you're only going to die for this. I know you're going to accept you as your savior. It's not. Is that what they're saying? Or are they saying, no, I would like some people to go from, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So no, it's Sunday, not true. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So actually, the so lineage. So what do you, 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 and the event at the church I was at the very least, they're like, no, I'm I didn't know that time call like like so it was it, it, he only died for the people who knew wait he didn't he elected the people doesn't matter these are the people you're dying for and nobody's gonna go to heaven and I'm choosing that. Yes and so what he's saying is we don't have to exactly That's, yeah okay that, that's my yeah, spectrum thing, right? Yeah. Um, so this is I'm gonna go to something that this one is Thank this you. one's a little bit more detailed. Um and this is Arminianism as well. So we don't we're not one that we don't fall into this one hundred percent, but we'll see things in this that we recognize. Um I'm gonna put this in that actually in that room I'm gonna put the link to the folder with these in it. Um and so you can like look at it later if you want to do we can definitely talk about this more, but uh, I knew it would be a little bit hard to read and a lot to read. And so, but it basically, you know, basically kind of follows along this and then kind of gives the counterpoint to it, which as we talk about it, we have our own, you know, our own beliefs and our own ideas. So we're kind of counterpoint it as we go along. Um, but but this is a good, uh, I really like the way this is laid out uh, on side by side. But so what you're talking about then is this right here. Um, you can notice that it's a little bit different, right? and, and we try we try with most of this. Uh, and so we would say God created mankind and then allowed the fall, right? Gave man the free will. And he said Christ is redeemed for all peoples. See how there is a little bit different about here's some people love the fall, and then God decides the decision to redeem the elect. See how, how, it, how it's kind of flow is a little bit different. And so the decision to redeem any decision to redeem any, any, any trust in Christ. Are you talking like the, the tip flag? It's like what? The tip flag. <laughs> That's what it brings out. They have they have another uh, thing they would do too. So the, the, by the use Passover almost. Oh, I'm going to come to that. Yes. 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 Yeah. Was, no wish, yeah. We don't want to get to that because to me, oh. to me, that is actually the more dangerous position than this this predestination, right? Um, and I don't have time to go into you know how I said I like create these pictures in my mind. I have this picture of like the very nature of creation, which kind of stalls this predestination problem in my mind. Um, but it's definitely in that theoretical category, like we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, so, but this, so this kind of a flow, right? And this right here is what you were talking about, what we believe, right? That, 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 that God calls us, but that we have a choice to reject that, right? Um, in fact, actually, we, we say that is um, uh, the unpardonable sin is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is rejection of the Holy Spirit in Paul, right? Um, you no, know, it used to be more of a thing preachers would say, you probably remember, but when people would say things like uh, they were standing there with their with their hands on the pew in front of them and their knuckles were just white because they were gripping the pew and they were under conviction that they were they were pushing away that conviction, right? Uh, like that. Okay. <laughs> so but these guys are gonna are gonna they're gonna reject this kind of call. Instead, their call is going to be God is going to say, it's time, right? You don't get a choice. You will be saved. You are one of You will be saved. Um, Do they believe in hell? Um, yes, yes. No, when I stand before God on Judgment Day, 
Sorry, we didn't elect me. I had no choice. It's not my fault. How can you convict me and send me to hell when I wouldn't even give you choice? Well, that's a really good question. That's a great question. <laughs> but it's it's really good. Good. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you, you just weren't done. That was, so that was, sorry, you just weren't done. And the series of y'all don't have to go out and do much to they don't that's the problem. Like, how many that they don't. Yes, that's what they do. No, like, what would the man do so it might be? Yeah, so that's uh, that's the other extreme of Calvinism, right? Um, uh, if you are a ultra ultra Calvinist, I think that's what they that, that's the phrase they use. Thanks. Then, yeah, I mean, you may, you may believe this, you may call out in different places and say I'm a Calvinist. But if you're one of the, if you're really an, old, an ultra Calvinist, you're not going to evangelize. God will, God, you're the one to be elect. God will save you in His timing, and you will show up on our doorstep. So what do they do in verses that say to go out and evangelize? So like Matthew 28, right? instead of because they're like, well, they say make disciples, so God's just telling you to train. That, that's how they use it. God's told me to train, not to go share. I asked the Calvinists one time, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I said, right here, it says that Jesus chose his 12, uh, 12 disciples, including Judas. But Jesus chose Judas, but Judas rejected Jesus. How is that? He didn't. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so then... I like little tidbits like that. So I want to show two more pictures, and then I want to get into what what you were looking at. So this during the Reformation, uh, and this is a prior to fifteen twenty, basically or almost uh, happened. And this is about fifteen fifty five, and what the world looked like. So we had Luther up here. Um, Luther is is this English fellow, um, and then this is we're, we're, this is Calvinism basically. Uh, so Luther's up here, and this is so dark because this is where Zurich is. This is where John Calvin was, and I mean it was like oh, it was just poor, poor right here. And then China went out, especially in Scotland also, um, but especially in, in here it's not colored in here uh, because this is Anglican, right? But the Puritans here were very much reformed, and that would have um, I mean that's why they went to America. You know, we, they were talking about like religious persecution. It was a lot of these guys that were being persecuted. Uh, but that's basically what the religious world looked like. There were lots of fighting here, lots of fighting here, lots of fighting here. You know, it was just kind of everywhere. Um, this Spanish women in Inquisition, Spain kind of stayed Catholic. They were like, they were hardcore down there. Um, and so I found this back today. I don't, I like it, but. What I would do on this is I would I wouldn't have put this right here. I wouldn't call this my like reform side. Uh, instead, I would say reformed theology would be like kind of this like general curve right here at the top, or just take it out completely. And I have no idea who these these groups right here are, but um, but I wanted to show this because we're just talking about Calvinism and Arminianism, and you see where Baptists are, right? We're kind of Touching kind of in the middle a little bit there. But then this is the next thing I want to talk about this idea of covenant theology versus dispensational. Um, and this is why I think that uh, in the reformed movement, this is the more dangerous position uh, or the more the more dangerous thing. Um, so basically, covenant theology is the idea that. Uh, well, of course, I want to make a note here. Uh, this note right here is perfect because not all covenant theologists agree with the number of names of theological um, uh, uh, I mean with, the, with the covenants, right? But basically, it's the idea that God had these covenants, and since the fall of man, we've been under the covenant of grace. What that means is that God has dealt with us kind of the same way all the way through, right? And so, but what that leads to is. Um, Hermeneutics is the uh, is the framework in which we create 
we need to create this uh, as a framework which we interpret the Bible by. Right? And so, covenant theology is going to put the New Testament priority over the Old Testament. So, the New Testament is a lens for interpreting the Old Testament. The New Testament transcends or reinterprets the Old Testament. So, to an extreme on this, um, we're talking about things like non literal fulfillments of Old Testament texts. Right? We're talking about uh, the shadows of the, the types and things like that. Really open for, uh, for um, things in the Old Testament to be out of the world. Um, and the Old Testament promises are ultimately, ultimately about Jesus, not about the creation of Israel. And Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. There's no reason to explain the literal fulfillment promises to the nation of Israel. In fact, um, we don't have that kind of again in all of this part right here, but this right here is really important. Under this theological idea, the church or, or Israel became the church. So the covenant, covenants, the promises, and things that are to Israel and to Abraham and all of that, those are transferred and reinterpreted into the church now, right? And so you get things like uh, it's still, it's a spectrum they all need to leave, right? But you get things like, um, well, maybe, maybe the story of Moses didn't actually happen. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Maybe David, the story of David's life happened, it did happen, maybe it didn't happen. It doesn't matter as much. Um, but how do we interpret the church? How do we interpret the New Testament uh, through the lens of those things, right? Um, I mean, they go to the extreme, it would be like the spoon in the tabernacle. I heard somebody talking about the spoon in the tabernacle. Well, that's symbolic of the current church's struggle to do something. The problem with that is who comes up with the definition of the symbolism from the Old Testament, right? Um, whereas we are, and, and I'm really reluctant to say this, but I, I'm not going to say we are, I mean, we and like our church. Southern Baptists, Evangelicals, um, we're much more dispensational in nature, although I am reluctant to say I'm a dispensationalist because when you start putting labels on yourself like that, that means something specific, especially to certain people. Um, so if I say I'm a dispensationalist, then what that could easily mean is that I'm a card carrying dispensationalist, not mean that. These are these seven dispensations, and that's all there is, and I agree about that, about that, but I'm not, you know, I'm not that. I mean, you know, hey, maybe that's seven, maybe it's not, you know, but, but I'm going to hold the belief like this. So I think what I understand, even I just had a passage, it is the author's intent, or the, the, um, the, the intent of the author, right? The passage. No passage has a priority over anything else, right? Can you define this dispensation, please? Define the dispensation. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to come to so, uh, so, dispensationalism is the idea that God has revealed himself in a progressive way throughout history, but that it's through different dispensations, through different time periods, right? So, there was at, up there, um, I don't know what all of them probably connect to, basically, the idea that, well, there was a time that Adam and Eve before they fell. And then there was like the time of the patriarchs, you know, and then you could say time after you no know, after Noah, you know, that's why it's like I'm not there was some maybe there was another woman, but it's these different God dealt with people in different ways. And then comes the nation of Israel, and then comes the church, and then comes the millennial reign of Christ, right? Um, which over here, these guys, we kind of get into some of this. Um, they're gonna be much less likely to believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ. Because why do the prophecies concerning Jesus ruling for a thousand years on the throne of David, those are easily dismissed under this idea of theology. But for us, that's literally what it's saying. And so, I don't know, that makes sense? Um, so that's why I think that, that's why I feel like this is more, this is the, the, the bigger issue uh, with the reform movement because it's, I mean, it's, it's radically different. And this is the view that we're going to interpret scripture by. Um, and there's so many different subjects. You could be a discipline, 
equation was on, you take seven subjects, and it could be uh, this equation was by ABC, but I feel differently about it. So it's not really anything other than a better thing to do is say you're one or the other is to say how you feel about a certain product. Okay. Having a conversation about it. And yeah, we're going to say, because I've been, and I don't think I've ever walk away and walk, walk around and say, I'm a disadvantage. I would say, I have a dispensational view of, of history. You know, uh, the, the kind of the, the, the linchpin of all this, you can narrow all this down to one question um, is going to be do you believe that Israel became the church? Because if you do, then you're going to fall into this guy, whether really you realize it or not. But if you don't, you say, no, Israel is Israel, right? But that's why also a lot of dispensationalists, especially the further you go on the, on the slide, they're definitely going to be um, millennialists. They're going to believe in a literal millennial reign of Christ. We're going to believe in a tribulation period. And most of these people are going to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. So when you really get into it, you see that Israel still has seven, seven years to be the, the primary influence, right? And so these guys are going to put that into the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation period. So we, we don't believe that Israel is the church. All we believe is Israel is the Jewish nation and they're God's chosen people who have really chosen for one thing, that the Savior of the world would come through them. That's been done. That's what they were chosen for. It's not like it's they're chosen for everything under the sun, right? Right. So, exactly. yeah, yeah. That's, so that's some people will, will take it to that yes. extent. Um, but because we believe in in as literal interpretation of Old Testament and New Testament, so God's not done with Israel, though, right? And so where does that play out in especially in time um, prophecies and things like that? So those prophecies about Israel that have not been fulfilled. They either have to be fulfilled in Israel in the future, or they are fulfilled within the church as the new Israel. Right? Does that make sense? And, um, and to clarify, Israel does not have another path to salvation at all. Absolutely. Not, absolutely, not, absolutely, not, absolutely no, not, absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and on either side of this, this, this is not this is not really a where is the, the other one predestination idea? That's definitely all about salvation, right? This is not about salvation. This is absolutely about how we interpret scripture um, and how we you know see future things and how we're going to determine, you know, especially with the old testament, how are we going to have the old testament relate to us today, right? Uh, what do we think about Israel? You know, uh, in fact, actually, um, y'all heard that song. Um, Abraham song, a little kid song. Abraham, Abraham son, yes. son, yes. son, father. Yes, yes. But that's all. If you think about it and you understand this, that song is 100% covenant theology. We are Abraham's children because we are New Israel. I have a friend that grew up a Muslim. He has an incredible testimony if you want to listen to it. His name is Afshin Ziafat. And he grew up in a Muslim home. He became a Christian. His testimony is absolutely phenomenal. And he had a friend that was a Muslim marrying a Christian girl. And, you know, they, they're going to get married. Nothing they could do about it. He did the wedding. And he went to, for, for their religious views, he just went straight to, you know, Abraham for everything, right? Because that's when the split happened. But it was kind of interesting how he mentioned how he did it. <laughs> Because he just went the, straight to Abraham. Because <laughs> yeah. that covers with both parties involved. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I watched the show one time that was, it was called Children of Abraham. And that's kind of a movement because uh, the Abrahamic religions, there's three main ones. I think there's a couple of like little side ones, but the three main ones are Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, so anyway, I wish I had time to like go through all of this, but like I said, I want to put the link to all of this in the in the group meeting so we can go in and look at it more if you want to. Um, but yeah, so let's pull stuff. Uh, let's see. 
I think that, oh, this one just kind of, oh, this, I only put this in or not to read it at all. I didn't even read all of it. I only looked at the colors, and I only looked at the colors because once this idea, um, and John Piper and what's the other big guy, MacArthur, John MacArthur? John MacArthur. Yeah. Um, so, and even like Watermark Church, where the, where the porch is at uh, in Dallas. So, so they're reformed churches, right? But when it comes over to this covenant theology side, they're backing way off of the original ideas. And so that's what this is. So like I said, don't read it necessarily. I mean, it's just one of you want to, but basically these are kind of the two branches of covenant theology, but this is kind of the new covenant theology ideas, right? And so these red, these red places are places where they're, where they're absolutely different, this new idea. Um, and these are where they're kind of different, but you still see that this is um, this is the five solas right here. And so this is um, you know basic Protestantism, so they're saying uh, this is Calvinism, so they're still you know five point Calvinist. Um, but now here, when it starts getting into this other stuff, um, they're backing off of a lot of what they've historically said. Um, I heard one guy talking about it, and he was like, it's because they're reading their Bible and they're seeing things and they're like, how, I, how, how am I going to really deal with this thousand year rain thing? I've got to do something with this, right? And so they're starting to back off on, on some of this. You know, but if the Bible says we're going to reign with God, it's my thought that our penalty judgment is before the thousand year reign. And then the great white throne judgment would be after the thousand year reign. Exactly. And then you got to turn yeah. But yeah, that's 100. Who am I to say exactly? Yeah, <laughs> and then that's 100 my belief also. Um, but yeah, anyway. So I don't know if this is I don't know if this is a good thing yet or or maybe not. Um, there's I mean they're still holding on to this, you know, and so. Um, but so there are also like it's it's also a spectrum with with covenant theology as well. I've met some who believe like the whole Old Testament is almost completely like like not literal, like yeah. it's not even true. Um, like it's just used as stories. Even but, when the then, history now the Bible is not a science book and it's not a, an archaeological book and it's not any of those things. But there's nothing in science and archaeology that contradicts it. In fact, there's some things that prove it. So what do you do when there's something written in the Bible and people have been saying for years and centuries that can't be right? What we know about that part of the world at that time is da da da. And then some some gets dug up, and archaeology actually proves. Wait a minute, that's yeah. So the so how do they how do they talk to things when archaeology is proving you know when there's other things happening? Well, I, well, I think it, I, when you look at the timeline of history, I think that that's kind of where it divides out a little bit because um, uh, the Hittites were a perfect example. So for, for hundreds of years, the Bible talked about the Hittites as a nation, right? Um, but there was no archaeological evidence. Nobody had heard of the Hittites. And then all of a sudden, oh, they start digging up stuff about the Hittites. And now that's a major, they're, they're a major component in that time of the world, right? But that time of the world is still where we know, I mean, relatively, we know a lot about, right? And so for the nation of Israel, kind of the breaking line is going to be at Babylon. And so when you start talking about Ezra and, and you know, that time period, Secular historians are going to say, "Yeah, Ezra was a guy, and you know this is where the he, the the Jews kind of began. You know, there was some like proto Jews maybe, but they probably came out of the Canaanites. You know, and the, these early beliefs were really Canaanite beliefs that they just kind of uh, adopted from their neighbors. You know, so that's what that's what historians like. If you watch something on the History Channel, that's what you're going to see. Um, and so before the Babylonian captivity." That falls into what they would call the, the category of um, legends, right? There's historical facts and figures, and then there's legends, and then there's myths. That is kind of their flow. So people like David, uh, um, 
uh, and the prophets and, and Saul, you know, those are the early kings and stuff. They would fall into the category of legends, but then people like the patriarchs would fall into the category of myths, right? And so that's how they explain it away. So we talk, we read stories about Enoch or Adam or people like that. Under, you know, under this idea, it doesn't matter that they're, they weren't weird or real, or maybe they were, it just doesn't matter. What matters is how does this story affect us today, you know, through the lens of the New Testament? So, well, there's a verse in the book, at least I remember it, where it talks about, and, and, and these are all these, all that's wrong except for you, you're getting the picture of, mm -hmm. in the seventh year of Caesar's mm -hmm. reign, during the third year of so-and-so's reign, so-and-so the governor for three years, and when you're reading that, you can go to secular history and say, 2980. It reminds me of the in like fictional books, where it's like I looked it up because I forgot exactly what it said. But at the beginning of most fiction books, it's going to say something along the lines of this: "This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, or incidents, and incidences are either products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events or persons living or dead are entirely coincidental." I feel like that's kind of where they're coming from. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally. Yeah. So, but our belief. And what you're saying, you know, kind of what you're alluding right. to, our belief is that we are holding to the Old Testament and the New Testament as being divinely inspired by God, right? Creator of the universe. So when we, we when we read something in Genesis, to us it's facts, right? And so we're interpreting that through our belief that God controlled the writing of this and that it's accurate and true. And so then we're going to interpret. Oh, there's no evidence for that. That's okay. God said it. But if you don't believe that there even that Moses even existed, and then Moses didn't write Genesis, you know, someone in Ezra's time wrote it and presented it as a story from the past. In fact, Genesis, I then he did Septuagint, the first five, right? Moses. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. the first five books of the Bible weren't those, and they were something else is what people are saying. So yeah, subscribe maybe in Ezra's time, or maybe in the intertestamental period, or something. Who's who is writing, but looking back on historical events, so he sprinkles a few in there, just things he knows or whatever. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah so that that's what I mean. We're, that's what when we're talking to people, we have to. Um, we have to understand that not everyone believing exactly the way we believe, right? So we can't just simply say, oh, the Bible says it, that settles it. But you got to find a starting point. Where's your yeah. starting point? Exactly. And so when you find your, your the epicenter, you know, whatever you want to call it, the starting point, then you, you go from there and then you start building from there. Right. Yeah. You got to find the most common denominator. No, that's exactly right. You got to find a point. You got to meet. So you got to meet people. Uh, no matter who it is, you got to meet people where they're at, not where you want them to be. And so, but when you meet someone where they're at, then you can work from that. And that's actually a very, very, um, uh, very biblical way of doing it. So you remember when Philip ran into the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Philip basically said, hey, what's up? And the Ethiopian was like, so I'm reading here in this passage from the Old Testament. Right, and then Bill was able to say, "Okay, let's start right here where you're reading, and now I'm going to take you to Jesus." So he literally met him where he was, and the end result of that conversation was the Ethiopian saying, "Hey, there's water. What keeps me from being baptized?" I mean, he had already like said, "Okay, so I'm fixing to be saved, and I'm already looking forward to baptism." You know, but where did he start? He started right where the Ethiopian was. So anyway, so. Um, that's that's definitely where we have to start with with anybody. Um, so oh, we're way over time. So the, the one question that we're asking everybody, right? So Reformed churches, whether they're Baptist or Presbyterian uh, or Methodist, are they saved? Yeah, I mean, there is. I yeah. think they're a little too saved. <laughs> yeah, some of them. Maybe the last. Now, church of Christ, they don't know if they're saved or not, right? Because they believe you can lose your salvation. Church of Christ? I think maybe 
Church of God that thinks they're the only ones that are saved. Church of Christ thinks they're the only ones that are saved. Of course, I've got a pretty church of Christ that said, written in the Bible, show me where it says your denomination, which didn't start until 2,000 years after this book was written, tell me where it says church of Christ are the only people saved in this book. Yeah. That's, I, I saw, you, you can't just take the fact that you picked a good name. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a funny video and it's like God like like giving like a believer a tour of heaven and like each room has their own like nomination, right? And he goes, and then they pass by one room and he's like, all right, I need to be very quiet. It's like, wow, well, the church of God is in there. They think they're the only ones here. <laughs> and, and oh, like, and he goes, the, and they keep walking and it gets to the baddest one, they get shh, they're praying. <laughs> That's not the first battle. I like yours better. So, uh, okay, anyway, so, uh, I mean, that's everything that I had to like throw up there. There's so much more. I was like listening to so much stuff driving back and forth to work the last couple of weeks. Um, just, I mean, some of this stuff back in this time, back in this time period, how did anybody get saved? I mean, I'm like, there was so much, you know, I, I Actually, Holy Spirit takes care of that. Yeah, and and it's on a on a little on a local yeah. level, right? When we talk about these guys, we're talking about them at this big academic level, right? I mean, Luther he put his his thesis on the church door, hoping to get debate from other academics, right? But out in the village over there, these guys, you know, I mean, today they're Catholic, tomorrow they're Protestant. I want to know how it works for those guys, you know. Uh, same thing with, oh, today I'm French and tomorrow I'm German, you know, because some group now controls my village. And so I'm paying vegetables to this guy instead of this guy today, you know. Um, but we have a very, very small view into that world. And that's, that's this is something I always tell anybody who I may disagree with about something is, hey, you may have different convictions than I do, and I'm not going to tell you you have to feel one way or another because I'm not your Holy Spirit. Right? <laughs> right? That, that's all God. God is your Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So, yeah. God might call you to do something that he doesn't call me to do. And, you know, there's stuff in the Bible, yes, we're all called to do the same thing, but, right. you know, some people might be called not to cut their hair. Samson, but I get it, but <laughs> so there's there's the personal thing Scott says you need to do that he might not say somebody else needs to do. But. Yeah. Um, but as far as women's team, it goes back to what you said the other day. Um, for for all of these groups, I think just talk to them individually and see where they are with Jesus. You know. So. Um, we have oh, one last story. I'm sorry, we were really late, but uh, we were at camp one year, and some of y'all y'all remember Tim Young, right? Um, y'all may not, but um, y'all do. And so, and y'all remember Chris Chris Squire? Chris Squire and I, we got along so well. I mean, we would spend hours just talking and debating and drawing pictures, just all kinds of stuff, right? And so, we were at camp one one year at at lunch, and there was this girl who came with a friend of hers, and she was Catholic. And she had questions. And Chris and I just happened to be sitting there. And you would have thought, I mean, we were so proud of ourselves. You would have thought we had rehearsed this, right? <laughs> she would throw up a question and we were like answering each other. I mean, just picking up and we were just going back and forth. Every question she had, we were so proud of ourselves. You know, and then two hour lunch was over. We went about our business. She still had more questions. She was always going to have more questions, right? And so later that night, she went and talked to Tim. Okay. Tim thought a little bit differently than we did. <laughs> and Tim goes, you know what? I know you got lots of questions and we can talk all night about your questions, but I have one question for you. What's your relationship like with Jesus Christ? She was saved talking to Tim, <laughs> not talking to John and Chris, <laughs> who was trying to answer all of her questions, right? So in all of this, that is like the number one focus right there that we always have. Where are you with us? The word, you know, who's Jesus to you? So all of this is fun to get into and talk about and everything. And I mean, but that's the the number one thing on an individual level, the person you're talking to, what's your relationship with Jesus? Anyway, anybody want to pray us out that way? I don't keep talking. <laughs> I'll do this. Thank you. Lord God, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to learn about others' beliefs, why they believe it, uh, learning how to meet them where they are. 
for we we can learn all this stuff and and we can put it to memory and we're thankful for that. But we just pray that the Holy Spirit shows up and tells us what to say and how to say it when we have an opportunity to share share you when others have a view. Um, um, one where you're not their savior at the time. And we just pray for the opportunity to meet them where they are, the Holy Spirit leads, and uh, we get an opportunity, even if we, we don't, all we care about is at least planting a seed and they accept Christ in the future or whether they accept Christ with us at that time and we get an opportunity to pray with them. Uh, we just want that opportunity to uh, plant a seed or, or have it come to fruition and uh, any opportunity. Just pray for opportunities during the week to share you with others. May we walk the way you want us to talk. May we think the way you want us to think. Just let the may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you this week. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, oh, and if y'all will this week, keep it Zeno in your prayers. Who? Zeno. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a week from now. 168 hours from this moment will be this moment. Next week, Zeno will be over. Praying for a lot. So great stuff over the whatever the number is there. Maybe. You can that be ready week. for this next week. I'll be ready. I'll be ready. <laughs> yes. A few of us met last night and kind of. Um, we had a great time. Finally, we got to looking at the stuff. Yeah. Wait, did you guys? Did you, I was there. I didn't know you guys met. Did you guys meet? No, it's all over. What happened? Next time, for sure. I, no, no, I, you, I, 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 no, no, I don't know. No, 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 no,